let me welcome everyone on our weekly colloquium. Today, our guest is Paul Skrzypczyk from the University of Bristol. So Paul defended his uh, PhD in 2011 under the supervision of Professor Sandu Popescu at the University of Bristol. Then he did two Paul's talks, uh, the first one in Cambridge and the second one uh, at ICFO in Barcelona with uh, Professor Asim. And this is where I uh, got to know Paul. Uh, since 2015, he's back to, to Bristol, where now he's a lecturer and Royal Society University Research Fellow, which I had to, to write because it's a quite long title. Uh, his scientific interests are quantum information theory, quantum thermodynamics, and foundations of quantum uh, theory. And today he will tell us about uh, linking resource quantifiers and operational tasks in, uh, in quantum information theory. So, Paul, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, thank you for inviting me. Let me share my screen. Is uh, that the screen? Yeah, that looks right. Yeah, so, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, I'll talk about two, two recent works of mine. Um, one with, with Noah Linden, who's a, a professor here in Bristol, uh, who I've been working with a lot lately, and uh, Andres Duquara, one of my PhD students. Um, mm -hmm. and as I said, it's about uh, quantum information theory, and in particular, this a resource theory approach, which has been very popular in recent years. Uh, and in particular, this kind of an interesting link from my perspective between uh, kind of quantifying resources and operational tasks. Um, and so to try and keep things simple for most of the talk, uh, I'm going to focus on one particular, say, very simple resource theory, which I think is very kind of it is a good playground to, to present these results. Uh, and it's an old question, kind of how do measurements give us information about the quantum world? Uh, and so you can apply this resource theory type approach to this question and you say get a resource theory of measurement informativeness so I'll, I'll explain what this is um, and then I'll discuss you know how would we quantify then how informative a measurement is so that's the kind of the basic question and so we'll talk about two different quantifiers that one can define both of them are, are nat relatively natural I would say and have appeared in, in other contexts in quantum information theory um, and then for me the main insight is this kind of new uh, the new insight is to understand a bit better the operational significance of these quantifiers. So you can define them, they're kind of geometrical in nature, um, and then they have a, a very nice operational significance in terms of uh, discrimination or exclusion type games. Uh, and this is the, this is the kind of the non-trivial uh, result, which is nice. And then once you've found these games, um, this then allows you to do something else, which is, which I'll explain to you, which is to think about when, when can one measurement be used to kind of simulate another measurement? You know, I, I have access to one measurement, when can I use it to perform another one? Uh, and I can get some necessary and sufficient conditions. And in the jargon, we call these monotones. So I'll, I'll explain this a bit later. And then very briefly at the end, I'll just kind of signpost you to how kind of general are these results. So I'll focus on one resource theory and I'll just kind of point you to what we already know and, and what are the challenges going forward to try and make this uh, as general as possible. OK, so I'll, I'll start off by introducing this so-called resource theory of measurement informativeness. Um, <clears throat> and so the basic question, I mean, a very, very old question is if I give you some if I have the ability to perform some measurement, so I have, say, you know, as a as a silly cartoon, I have some box here, the measuring device, where I, you know, I come along, I give you a quantum state, some density operator row, I measure it, uh, and then I get the outcome. And, and just to be clear, uh, in this talk, I'm going to consider the kind of the simplest use of measurements, where I'm not worried about the post measurement state. I'm just going to be worried about the the result of the measurement. And so, you know, as as I'm sure we all know, the most general um, description of a measurement then in quantum information theory would be the so-called POVMs. So just a collection of positive operators which sum up to the identity with some arbitrary number of outcomes uh, which give me the probabilities via the, the standard Born rule, right? So I take the trace of my POVM element times by my quantum state. And I want to know how much information, I mean, what does it mean to talk about the information that this measurement provides for me about the, the underlying quantum state? As I said, not, not a new question, but a, a, like a very old and, and basic question about quantum mechanics. Um, and so the, the, the approach that we thought would be interesting to take, so this was Nora and I, um, we wanted to approach this from this so-called resource theory approach. And so a resource theory has three major ingredients. So you view something which you care about as a resource, as uh, so you have resourceful objects, you then need to identify objects which are kind of resourceless uh, and a way of manipulating objects. So the 
this kind of whole idea started with the theory of entanglement, where we kind of we view entanglement as a resource, and so then that that's the thing which is valuable to us. Then what is a, a non-resource? Well, that would be a state where it has no entanglement. So like a separable state would be a would be a free state in the in this kind of terminology. And we have a, a natural class of operations in entanglement theory would be well, I can communicate classically and I can manipulate in local labs. So this was this is a so-called resource theory of of entanglement and, and in recent years lots of people have been applying this approach to many uh, contexts um, in quantum information and so let's think about what would it be in this particular context here uh, so the resource is somehow a measurement which is informative so like a, a good measurement is, is what's our resource something that tells me a lot about the underlying quantum system um, then obviously what's free is just the the opposite of that I mean the tautology so far is to say that that would be something which is uninformative so we have to think carefully about what that means um, and then these operations, I've already referred to them. I think this would be a, a measurement simulation. So this idea of, you know, kind of using one measurement and transforming it into another one. In other words, use a measurement to pretend as if I have a, a different measuring device in the lab. Uh, very, very theoretical uh, at this stage. Um, so these are the, the three ingredients uh, which, which we want. And so let's, let's have a think what they are. And it, it's easiest to start in the middle. So it's easiest to think, well, what, what does it mean to have an uninformative measurement? Um, well, this is a measurement where, which basically is going to be constant on any quantum state, right? So in particular, imagine you have a measurement and for all quantum states, you get out exactly the same probabilities. Well, then that's told you absolutely nothing about the underlying quantum state. You may as, you may as well have not have measured. And so mathematically, what would that correspond to? Well, it would, if you think about it, it's a P of EMs, which are kind of completely trivial. Every P of EM element is just proportional to the identity operator. And what multiplies the identity operator in order for it to be positive and normalized is a set of probabilities. So you get a, you know, it's basically a device in here, which, you know, the quantum state comes along, it doesn't measure it. It just spits out a, a random result according to some random variable encoded in, in Q. So that, that, that would be what would be free. And so that, that's the kind of in this jargon, this is our free set of objects. Um, yeah, and as I said, sorry. So this is the key point here is that the then the probabilities are independent of, of, of the density of the quantum state. So it's as if no measurement is performed. And so then a, a resourceful measurement, we can then say, well, any measurement which is not of this form, uh, it clearly has some dependence. The probabilities which I observe will have some dependence upon the, the state I measure. So it's telling me something about the state. So this is then is a very kind of non-controversial, I would say, definition for what it means to be informative is, is just not completely useless and again if you're used to entanglement theory this is exactly how we define entanglement it's something which is not separable so it's, it's kind of defined by a by a contra positive um, and so the main question of this kind of talk is is really how to quantify this then you know this, this is very you know black or white either it's informative or it's not and we would want to somehow talk quantitatively so that's what I want to talk about mostly and I'll come back to that in a minute but before I we focus on this. Uh, let's think about this third ingredient of a resource theory, which is what are the allowed transformations? What are the, how can I manipulate the objects? Um, and so the, what's natural to allow uh, in this context is the idea of a measurement simulation. So this idea of I have one measurement, now I want to use it to, to simulate something else. And so the easiest way to explain this is with a, with a picture. So what, what would I think of as a measurement simulation? So I've got my actual device in the middle here. This, this is the M that I have access to, let's say. And now how can I simulate another um, measurement? Well, before I measure my quantum state, I might first, you know, pro, I might transform it with some unitary. And I, I might have a, you know, maybe I don't want to do this deterministically. Maybe I want to flip a coin and depending upon the value of that coin, apply one unitary or another. So let me assume I have some shared, some randomness, which I'll call lambda, and I'll, you know, I'll flip, I'll look at this randomness and depending upon its value, I'll then do some transformation before I measure the state. So this is kind of a, a pre-processing, uh, if you like. Then I can measure the, the system that's been now transformed and I'll get this measurement result. And now I might want to say, think of a fictitious result. So I kind of might post-process this, this classical data and again, I might do this probabilistically in the, mo in the most general setting, I could imagine doing this probabilistically, um, also conditioned on this random variable. So I might have, I mean, this lambda is a bit like a memory. 
So I, you know, I did something, I measure it, and now depending upon the result I saw and, and how I transformed it, I'll come up with a new measurement. And so that whole process, I mean, it takes a quantum state to a classical random variable B, so this is a, another measurement. So this, is a, this allows me to simulate a measurement, let me call it N, using a measurement M. Right. Um, and so if you want mathematically, what, what are the POVM elements of this measurement N in terms of the POVM elements of the measurement M? Well, you just have to go to the Heisenberg picture and you get this formula here. So you sum over the A and the lambda, you apply the, the unitary backward on the measurement outcomes, that's the Heisenberg bit, uh, and then you do this summation. So this is our allowed transformation. So it's kind of useful to think of me transforming one measurement into another uh, via this kind of procedure. Um, and if I can't look inside the box, I may not know if I'm doing such a procedure uh, on, on my, before I measure my system. Okay, so this is our resource theory. We have useful measurements. Given a useful measurement, I can then simulate, say, other measurements using this uh, tr simulation trick um, or procedure. And now I want to quantify how, how good a measurement is, how, how resourceful a measurement is. Um, and sorry, I should just say, so we use a, a kind of a partial order type notation. Uh, which is common in the literature to say that if you know if m can simulate n it's you know it's before n in this kind of partial order of 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 measurement simulation and so i'll write that m is you know is better than n if you like so that that's a notation i'll use in this talk okay so now we have this notion of uh, this is this resource theory and so what we would like to do is then think about quantifying uh, the measurement informativeness um, and so in particular we want to you know we want to if i have two measurements for example I would like to be able to make statements to say, well, you know, measurement one is more informative than measurement two. I, I would like to make kind of meaningful uh, statements of this type. Uh, so this is what we would like to do. And so there are two approaches we're going to take. So the first approach is what I did with Noah Linden. Um, and you can think about how resourceful, what, one way to think about how resourceful something is, is to think about how difficult it is to destroy that resource. So this is a, an approach again, which was taken in entanglement theory. So you say, if I have a lot of entanglement in a quantum state, then how difficult is it to kind of ruin that entanglement and bring it down to the, the separable form? And so again, here we can, we can kind of think in, a, in some way intuitively to say, well, if I have a, a measurement and it's very difficult to turn it into a useless measurement, well, then surely that is a measurement which is very informative, right? So if I, if I want to destroy the ability of the measurement to tell me something, that, that should be a good way of quantifying it. And this is known uh, generally as, as a robustness. So this is the first type of quantifier we'll, we'll introduce. Um, but one could also go the other way, if you like. So this is kind of the, in one direction, and, and another direction is to think, well, you know, if I have a, something and I want to say, simulate it with, with something else, which I know is resourceful, well, how much, kind of how much resource do I need in order to, to reproduce it, right? So this is, this is what's known as the weight. And again, this kind of arose in the theory of entanglement. So again, if you have a, a state which is entangled but not too entangled, I mean, like a state which has got some, some amount of entanglement in it, you could kind of think, well, you say, well, what if I give you the, the most entangled state, the, the maximally entangled state, kind of how much maximally entangled state do I need to consume in order to, to build this state, right? It's kind of like I, my gold standard resource, how much of that gold standard do I need in order to build this thing which has less resource in it and if i if i can quantify that that also gives me a measure of of how resourceful i am so we want to apply these two kind of trusted ideas uh, in the context of, of measurements now um, and this second part is what i did with my my phd student uh, andres okay so let's start with the with the robustness uh, of measurement um, and so the basic idea is you say well let's in say that instead of performing the measurement m that i care about all of the time Let's imagine that with some probability P, I perform that measurement. So I kind of flip a coin and I perform the measurement I care about. And with some probability one minus P, I now perform not the measurement I care about, but I perform something else. And I'll think about this as being kind of a noisy measurement. So let's assume I don't have control and sometimes I prepare what I, I do what I want to and sometimes I prepare what I don't want to. And this is kind of this noisy process, which is then degrading my measurement, let's say. And so the question is, you know, how much noise do I need to add in in this kind of degradation type fashion in order to ruin the measurement. Um, and so this is what we then call the robustness of measurement or informativeness to be more precise. So we're going to take the, the smallest amount of noise that we need um, that makes the measurement uninformative with the worst case noise. So th there's a few different ways you could approach this problem. You might want to fix the noise and maybe you would take it to be some kind of, say, white noise. Um, 
it turns out that the, a very nice way of doing it, which is, we'll see this operational significance later, is that if you take the worst case noise, this, this turns out to be the nicest way of, of, um, of approaching this problem for, for reasons that I hope to convince you of in this talk. <clears throat> and so in particular, um, up to a bit of mathematical, uh, I mean, it, it looks a bit unusual because we, we, we follow the literature and we, we're gonna take a mathematical, um, okay, for many reasons, we're gonna redefine our probability. So instead of using P and one minus P, uh, we switch and we, we introduce a parameter R and P is just one over one plus R, meaning that you know one minus P is then R over one plus R. So I, this is this uh, combination that I talked about. So with probability P being one over one plus R, I use a measurement M. And then with probability R over one plus R, so that's my one minus P, I use some other measurement N. And I want to know when is this gonna become useless? So in other words, when is it gonna have this, this form of a useless POVM element? So that's on the right hand side. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm now gonna try to minimize this, this R, meaning I'm gonna make the probability with which I use the noise as small as possible, but I'm gonna take the worst case noise and I'm gonna take the, say the worst case informative measurement uh, and this gives me my definition. So this is our definition for the robustness of, of measurement. Um, and so let's just have a, a quick uh, think about this definition. So, I mean, hopefully the first thing you can see is that if the measurement is itself uninformative, um, so in other words, if, if already I have a measurement which is useless, well then this robustness is going to be zero because then I don't need any noise. I already have an equality between the left and the right. So it, it is capturing, so that, that's kind of a, a good thing. So we want to see that when it's, this isn't gonna misidentify something as being uh, as useful when, when it's clearly not. Um, and also hopefully you'll, I mean, you might start to see intuitively that when the measurement is highly informative, so if somehow if this is very far from being you know, of this form QA times the identity, then I'm gonna need to add in somehow lots of this noisy measurement in order to ruin it. So it, it feels like it has some of the properties we'd like. Um, but again, we're, we're defining this in analogy to many other resource theories in quantum information theory, uh, where this is proven to be a useful way of proceeding. So this is kind of the motivation comes from that as well. And so, it's very useful to think about this uh, quantifier geometrically um, and in some sense it, it really is a geometrical type quantifier and so how do we do that well we can think about the space of all i mean there is a space of all measurements so we could think about you know mapping povm elements into some high dimensional space and you know as a cartoon i'll i draw it as this kind of as this oval here and this is the the space of all measurements and then there's going to be a subset of measurements, which are these uninformative ones, these ones which are useless. Uh, and so in this resource theory of measurement informativeness, uh, this is actually a, a very low dimensional uh, subset. So there, there's many fewer parameters to play with. And so, you know, in the picture, I, I'll then depict it as a line. So it's this low dimensional space. And the measurement I care about, the one I'm trying to do this quantification of is, is gonna live somewhere out here, say. So it's some, it's some resourceful measurement. Now I want to say quantify, you know, the resource here. And so how, what is then this uh, robustness? Well, so actually what you do is you, you pick a noise, which is somehow on the other side of the, of the useless, of the resourceless set. And th this can kind of, this can move around uh, on the boundary. And this kind of on this line segment, which is all, I mean, measurements of this form, you know, you're gonna end up, there'll be this point here on in the useless set, which is the, my useless measurement. And you've got the noise over here. And it turns out if you sit down and, and have a look at it, this ratio of this, you know, the length here versus the length here, this is exactly the robustness. So it really is a, a nice kind of, uh, yeah, geometrical type quantifier, which is telling you more or less the, the distance uh, from this useless set. Um, and yeah, okay. So that was the robustness. Uh, and so now let's switch over and let's do the same for the weight. Um, and so just to remind you, so how did we define the weight? So this time we said, well, instead of performing the measurement all of the time, we now use some resourceful measurement with probability P and we use a resource list measurement with probability one minus P. So we, we're gonna kind of flip a coin and use something valuable or use something that's free. Um, and again, it's the, we're gonna take the minimal amount of resourceful thing we need to use in, in the best case. So we're gonna to try to optimize over the, the thing which I'm allowed to use. So I'm not gonna fix the, I'm not gonna fix the, the resource. I'm gonna allow myself to optimize over, over resources here. Um, and so now 
in this case, it turns out it's useful to stick to P in one minus P. And so again, we get this convex combination. So we're gonna say that the measurement that I care about, I'm now gonna decompose it is a P, I mean, with probability P, I perform the measurement N, and with probability one minus P, I perform this, this useless measurement. And I want to somehow find out the optimal decomposition of this form. Um, okay, and again, so we, we have a similar, we can do the similar analysis that we did for the robustness. So again, if, if M happens to be uninformative, well, then it's clear I can just set P is equal to zero and I'll get a quality. So I'd never need to use a resource. So again, this is kind of, this is a useful property. It's it only, I mean, it is zero when this is uninformative, so I don't get any false positives. And again, when, when the thing is highly informative, means that I, I you know, I, it should be the case that I'm gonna need lots of a resource uh, in order to simulate it. That, that's the intuition here, um, okay? And also we can do the same geometry. So let's go back to the picture we had for the robustness with the same set of all measurements and the same uh, space of uh, useless ones. And here's our measurement sitting in the middle. And so geometrically, what is this quantifier? Also now we somehow go the other way. So now our point M sits in the middle and we, we, we draw this line which connects the resourceless set to the boundary. And now the, the weight is, is now the, is how long is this segment here L relative to the overall uh, segment here, uh, L plus L. So this again is, if you just sit down and, and have a, a play, you realize that this is what, the, what you should do. And, and so when you optimize, you're basically you know, rotating this line uh, in order to get the, this ratio as, 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 as good as possible, um, okay? So those are our quantifiers. And so I just copied them up the top here. And so let me just tell you a, a couple of the key properties that they, they satisfy. So they both satisfy lots of the nice properties, kind of all the desiderata that we want in a, in a resource theory. Um, so I already mentioned before that the, if, there is, if the measurement is useless, uh, then these quantifiers are both equal to zero, but it's actually also, I mean, it's, it's that's if and only if the result, uh, the measurement is uninformative. So both of them have the property that we call this faithful to say that they are zero if and only if the, the, the measurement is resourceless. So that's kind of property, that's like the first property you would want of a, of a kind of a good quantifier. So no false, false positives or no false negatives. <clears throat> uh, second of all, uh, it's very nice, but you, you also have convexity. So what you wouldn't want to be true is that if you say have two measurements and you flip a coin, and you perform one or the other, and then you forget which one you performed, well, surely that shouldn't make, give you more resource, right? If, you're, if your quantifier tells you that that's a better procedure than performing either of the measurements individually, then you've clearly gone wrong. Uh, and so it's, it's a very simple proof in both of these cases, but you can show that they both satisfy this property. So you'll, if you have ignorance about what measurement you performed, that will only reduce the resource that you think you, you, you hold on to. So that, that's reasonable. Um, and then finally, the, the last one, which is, I mean, kind of sits well within this resource theory, is that again, if I, if I give you, if I have a measurement and I now use it to simulate another measurement, it's kind of a bit more advanced in this convexity, well, surely that shouldn't uh, increase the resource either, because this, you know, the, this thing I've simulated, the, the resource inside that simulation was a measurement, all I'm doing is just playing with it, it shouldn't tell me that I somehow can learn more about my system, and indeed this is true, so the robustness can only go down, if one measure under if, if m can be if n can be simulated by m, then the resource in n cannot be greater than the resource in m. And both of these quantifiers have that property. So these are the three key properties you want, uh, and we satisfy all of them uh, it, with both of these quantifiers. <clears throat> okay, the, the next uh, property they have, which is more mathematical, but which turns out to be very useful, um, is that both of these uh, quantifiers are given by a, a special type of optimization problem, uh, which is known as a semi-definite program. And this is a type of optimization problem which occurs very frequently in quantum information theory. Um, and so that means that we get a lot, there's lots of positive things knowing this. Um, so in particular, with a bit of playing and, and redefining variables, you can write, okay, instead of writing the robustness, it's useful to write one plus the robustness. I just move the one on the other side. Uh, but you get a, a very simple problem. So de semi-definite programs are, are very easy to solve in practice and they have a very nice analytical theory uh, built around them, which is why we, we like this property. 
Um, so you can, by playing around, you can rewrite the robustness in this form. The explicit form is not too important, but just to say, uh, you know, this is what you get. Uh, and the weight uh, can be written similarly. So I can write one minus the weight now as a maximization over, over some numbers which form a vector, uh, which satisfy a single uh, matrix inequality. So semi-definite programs have linear objective functions and, and linear matrix inequalities as constraints. And so these are the, these are the type of problems I have here. Uh, and as I said, so this shows explicitly that these problems are, are convex optimization problems. So in the top form here, this isn't completely obvious because I have variables multiplied together. I have my un and r, which I'm optimizing over, multiplied by this na, which I'm also optimizing over. So there could be some kind of non-linearity and non-convexity in this definition a priori. But once you've re-expressed it in this form here, you realize that it's a, a convex optimization problem. So it has a, you know, a global optimum, which is which is nice. This is what we like. Um, as I said, in practice, this means that they're kind of easy to solve. So you can go and, you know, MATLAB or Python or Julia or whichever language you like, and you can, uh, I mean, solve this for basically any any situation of interest in quantum information theory, you can actually figure out these numbers. So they're, they're not kind of just abstract things that we can't compute. You can really uh, compute them and I'll, and I'll even come to some examples uh, in, a, in a few minutes. <clears throat> uh, and finally, one thing that's gonna be very important for us is that as when you, once you've got to this convex optimization uh, problem, uh, there's something called the duality theory. So every convex optimization problem has a, a problem called a dual. Uh, and this is very useful, and, and our main result is based upon is using this duality theory. In fact, uh, which which I find the most interesting uh, from a mathematical uh, perspective. Okay, but I mean the truth is that actually once you get to this uh, this STP formulation, if you're if you're used to these STPs and you and you stare at them for a little bit, what you actually realize is that they allow you to just explicitly solve. For these uh, for the quantity, so you, I actually can just write down what is the robustness of measurement. Um, so this is true just for the resource theory of measurement informativeness. In other resource theories, you'll get to this stage where you have the that it's very often a, a convex optimization problem, uh, but you can't normally explicitly solve them. It just happens that for measurement informativeness, everything is so simple that you can actually just solve explicitly. And for example, this constraint here if you look at it the correct way, you realize that this is actually just putting a bound on the largest eigenvalue of, of MA, because I'm, I'm trying to minimize this number. And this is just telling me, well, all of the this QA has to be at least as large as the largest eigenvalue of MA. And so what you realize is that this will be minimized by just setting QA to be equal to the largest eigenvalue. And so once you've realized this, you realize that this is nothing but just the sum of the largest eigenvalues of all of your POVM elements. So again, I find this nice because we, we started in this very geometrical place. We didn't know that this is what it was going to come out to be. And then you just follow through the math and you get to this, you realize this is what we defined. So that's, um, I find that quite nice. <clears throat> and similarly, if you look at the, the weight problem and you, uh, again, you've got this, uh, uh, it turns into a lower bound. And so again, this is going to be, and I'm trying to maximize, well, this has to be smaller than the smallest eigenvalue of MA. And so again, I get then that this is just nothing but the, the sum of the smallest eigenvalues. So you somehow see that these are very um, kind of diametrically opposite to each other. One of them just cares about the minimal eigenvalue of all your POVM elements, and the other one just cares about the sum of the largest eigenvalues. Um, so this is kind of a nice uh, two ends of a, of a spectrum, uh, I would say. And as I said, this is maybe not so obvious from the original definitions, maybe if you've played around with them enough, but it's, uh, it, it was a nice realization for us. Well, can I have a question? Of course, yes. So are there any relations between these two quantities? Mm. Uh, in general, no, because you can say, I mean, you can keep a measurement, you can keep the largest eigenvalue more yeah. or less the same constant for a measurement and play with its smallest eigenvalue, right? So it, it's, you have, especially, I mean, maybe for qubits they're related, but for larger higher dimensional systems, it, it's very easy to kind of get them to vary. And, and maybe you can see this geometrically because depending upon the structure of where you are in the space, the two of them can be very, very different from each other. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so I was, I'm going to give you some examples in a second just to try and make this a bit more concrete. But before I do so, I just want to think about the bounds. So how big or small can these quantities mm -hmm. be? Um, 
So for the weight, it's relatively simple. The weight is something between zero and one, right? It is, it's a probability. It's this probability with which I need to use uh, a resourceful measurement. So the bounds on the weight are, are kind of easy. Um, the bounds upon the robustness, you have to be a little bit more careful, um, but it turns out that if you have O outcomes, uh, the robustness can never be larger than O minus one. Um, but also then there's a kind of a universal bound which says that it can never be larger than the dimension. So th this is important for two reasons. So on the one hand, if you say you're in a very large dimensional system, but you're only doing say a two outcome measurement, then that measurement by this uh, quantity can't be that informative. So the fact that you only have very few outcomes limits how much information you're getting from your system, which, which sounds very reasonable. On the other hand, imagine you have say a lower dimensional system and you go to a, some very a measurement with lots and lots of outcomes, this doesn't allow you to get more and more kind of information. So again, there's kind of a bound and it's natural that the bound should be the dimension. So once you've gone past the dimension, you're never gonna learn more, uh, the robustness can't go up. So again, this, this, this fills, I mean, th these bounds do make sense. So th this is the bounds that we have on the robustness and on the weight. And so now with these in place, uh, a very natural question is, well, what are the most informative measurements according to these quantifiers, right? So do they, does it make sense? Um, and the answer is yes. More, I mean, I would say they make a lot of sense. Um, so let's think about, let, let's go through some cases. So the most obvious measurement to check is the, is like the ideal measurements, right? So where we have a, a rank one projective measurement. So each of my POVM elements is just a, a one dimensional projector. So, you know, textbook quantum mechanics now. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, each of these is a, is a projector. So they all have an eigenvalue one and an eigenvalue zero. And so the robustness is just the sum of the eigenvalues. And so we said that one plus R was equal to D. So in other words, I get the robustness is D minus one. So it, it is maximal. Um, so that's what we, so that's good. And again, the weight is going to be equal to one because all of these eigenvalues are zero. So by both definitions, this is a, the maximally informative measurement. So that's uh, good. Um, so is this the only set of uh, measurements which are maximally resourceful? Well, no. Um, it turns out that any rank one measurements are maximally informative according to both measures, right? So now imagine that I give you a, a POVM elements where say there's more than D of them now. So uh, like, a, you know, some four outcome measurement on qubits or something like this. Um, <clears throat> so I'll need a positive coefficient in the front here. Um, and the sum of these coefficients has to sum up to D in order to satisfy the normalization constraint. And so now if you go through the, I mean, the, you know, the one line calculation, you'll see that the robustness comes out to be exactly equal to D minus one again, just because of this constraint. Um, and again, the weight, these are rank one, so they all have zero eigenvalues. And so the, the weight is equal to one. And this is good because rank one measurements of this type include a tomographically complete measurement. So I could, you know, measurements where I can just do one measurement on a system and know the state of the system are of this type. So it feels to me very natural that they should be maximally informative. They're, they're clearly, they're, you know, they have the ability to tell me everything about the system. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So th that that's reassuring. But, but Paul, uh, maybe a small comment. So to me, it sounds like they should be more, even more informative than the projective measurements. No? I mean, so okay, so that it's a good question. So we we haven't. I mean, according to both of these quantifiers, they turn out to be the same. Exactly. Um, but I agree with you that there is a feeling that you learn more about a system. So that mm -hmm. that's a kind of a good open question, which is, well, what what would be a quantifier that's able to differentiate? like ideal projective measurements with rank one measurements. So I don't have an answer to that yet, but, but it's a good question. I, I, I agree with what you're saying. Okay, so finally, this, these are two classes of measurements which uh, are the same for both quantifiers. So do the, do the quantifiers agree for all measurements? Uh, so actually they don't. And so there's a, you can go to a, an, another extreme, which are measurements which are kind of poor. So these would be rank D minus one measurements. So what do I mean? I mean that every single POVM element is a project, well, it's proportional to a projector um, and the projector that it's proportional to is ranked D minus one, right? In, in a D dimensional space. And so now if you look at the robustness, the robustness goes down very quickly and now it's almost zero, right? So in, in high dimensions, it's one over D minus one. So th this measurement in terms of robustness is, is very poor. Um, and indeed these type of measurements, they feel, I mean, at least to me, intuitively, they feel very bad. You're, you know, you've got very 
high rank projectors. They don't seem to be telling you too much. But interestingly, the weight still, it turns out that the weight of these is still one. Because they're ranked D minus one, they still have a zero eigenvalue. And because of this zero eigenvalue, they have weight one. Um, so this is still maximally informative according to this measure. Um, so this is, a, say, a bit of the mystery, and this is uh, one of the things which is why we really need to understand, is there some operational significance of this uh, weight, you know, of this being maximally informative. And so at least geometrically, they are on the boundary of the set, um, but that doesn't feel good enough to me yet. I, we wanted to go further. So this is uh, this kind of sets me up for now thinking about the operational significance. So could we understand why for the, these two classes of measurements, they're both viewed as they're both maximally informative but for this final class of measurements I have this huge discrepancy one of them being almost useless and one of them being a uh, uh, very still as maximally uh, resourceful <clears throat> okay and so this leads me then into the operational significance uh, of these quantifiers how am I doing for time yes okay okay and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to introduce a task um, and I'm going to show you that these quantifiers that we've introduced are relevant for these tasks. Actually, I'm going to introduce two tasks, one task for each of the situations. So I'm going to start with a task, uh, which again is very well studied in quantum information theory, uh, which is quantum state discrimination. <clears throat> so what do I imagine? Again, what is the cartoon here? So I imagine I have some, some source of quantum particles, um, but it doesn't always spit out the same quantum state with probability, say, Q of X. It spits out the quantum state sigma of X with this classical label X, right? And in a state discrimination kind of task, your goal is to correctly identify which of the states was sent to you by the source, right? So it's a relatively, it's kind of a, a very simple game where you encode classical information in a quantum state and then you want to get that classical information back out of the state. And so, I mean, one thing you could do is say you could imagine then how would a player who's playing this game, how, how can they kind of optimally play this game? We're gonna place a restriction on our players motivated by the scenario that we're considering which is that we just give them a fixed measurement m and we say okay this is the thing you're allowed to use in order to play this game um, you can't perform any other measurement except for the one i give you and now we want to think about what is the best strategy they could they could perform and so the best strategy let's focus on the picture i mean again it is basically intuitively it's the following so maybe you you don't want to act deterministically so let's try and be as general as possible so let's have some shared randomness on the side but you know this particle comes out of the you're given this particle maybe you first want to to do something to kind of pre-process it then you want to measure it using the the measurement you have um and then you've now got this outcome a and you have to make a guess so i'll call it g for guess and the guess is going to depend upon what? Well, it will depend upon the results you got from the measurement. And again, maybe depending upon how you pre-processed it, you may want to change your guess. And so this is my, my, uh, this is my procedure. So this is my optimal strategy uh, will be of this type. And so how are we going to quantify how well we do? Uh, we're going to use the, the average with which we get it correct. So we're going to look at the, the guessing, so-called guessing probability. So how, you know, what is the probability that my guess G is equal to the X, which was actually, you know, encoded in the state. So what I'm going to have to do is, so this P guess is essentially, you know, I've got the probability of the Q of X times the probability that my guess equals X, given that it was X. Um, and I'm going to allow myself to optimize over strategy. So I'm going to allow myself to optimize over the guessing strategy, optimize over the pre-processing and optimize over the, the unitaries that I apply. Um, and this P of G given X, well, it is just the one that follows again from this picture, right? So the, the particle comes, it gets in the Heisenberg picture, it gets, oh, sorry, no, in the Schrodinger type of picture, the particle gets transformed, then it gets measured, and then I, and then I update my classical information. So as you can see, hopefully you might see the analog of this with this measurement simulation that I had uh, at the very beginning of this resource theory. So this is no coincidence, this is very much related to the, to the to this measurement simulation so um, a, a nicer way to write this mathematically then is to say what i'm going to maximize over is all of those measurements n which i can simulate which which i can simulate given access to the measurements n right so all the measurements which are simulable by m and this is my optimization <clears throat> okay so this is my my guessing probability so this is this quantifies how well i do in this game using the measurement m and what do we want to do? So that's what I've got copied at the top here. So what we would like to ask ourselves is we want to compare this to something. 
And so what we're going to compare it to is how well would we do uh, in the case when I don't have a resource, so when I have an uninformative measurement, which is to say, I mean, this is just a, a fancy way of saying that I, I have no ability to measure the quantum state, right? So this source is emitting a quantum state, and I basically have no way of measuring it because the measurements I can perform tell me nothing about the quantum state. So what is an optimal guessing strategy in that case? You know, if I'm playing this game and I don't have the ability to, to measure the state, well, I should always guess the same state and I should guess whichever state is most probable. So imagine one of the states is coming out 90% of the time and all the others are coming out with small probability. Well, of course, I'm going to guess the state which is coming out 90% of the time and I'm going to get it right whenever that state comes out. So I should just do the trivial thing of guessing the most likely state. Okay, and so now what do we do? So what are we, we're going to ask ourselves is we're going to look then at kind of this, we, we call this the advantage we get. So we're gonna think about how well can I guess the, how well do I do in this game when I have access to the measurement M and I'm just gonna kind of normalize relative to how well could I do in that game when I don't have access to a measurement. So it's just kind of keeping track of the, you know, it's taking out this game dependent bit uh, and just focusing on the measurement dependent bit. Uh, and then what we do is we then maximize over all games of this type. So we maximize over every single uh, state discrimination game. Uh, and this is the, the nice result is that if you do this optimization, what you find is that this ratio is exactly one plus the robustness of the measurement. So this is then the operational significance. So it's telling you that the robustness is quantifying how much of an advantage do I get in the, in the optimally chosen state discrimination game when you give me access to the measurement M. Like how much does it boost me above my success probability? I, I get this boost in success probability because of the measurement and the, the success I get is exactly quantified by the robustness. So if I have a measurement which is more robust, then I'm gonna get a larger advantage. So it's telling me more about the quantum state and therefore I'm able to, to win better when I compared to when I have no ability to measure. Um, and so this is the result. And so how do we prove this so that the proof goes in in two steps and, and it's quite nice. So on the one hand, I, I told you that the, the robustness of measurement could be specified as a, as a this semi definite program. So once you've written it in that form, uh, it's relatively easy to show that you get an upper bound to show then that this ratio of P guess, like using the measurement over the P guess without the measurement, can never be larger than one plus a robustness. So that, that's a, a relatively easy corollary of just taking that definition, doing a you know, couple of lines, doing some multiplications, and you get this result. So, but of course, having an upper bound is, is not so interesting unless you can show that it can be achieved. Um, and so the, the step two is then to show you can actually achieve it. By, and how would you do that? Well, it means you need to find some game such that the, this ratio is equal to one plus R, right? So we know you can't do better than it. But the question is, how do you find a game? How do you extract some game which is actually optimal for this uh, separation? And you do this via this duality. So I, I said before that every SDP, every semi-definite program has a, has a dual formulation. And it's actually this dual which gives you the optimal game that you should play. So this is the, the nice bit of this theory which comes in. So let's just jump to this then quickly just to explain it. So yeah, every every convex optimization problem, and in particular then semi-definite program as, a, as an, an instance of this, has a formulation in terms of the so-called, I mean, dual variables, which are essentially the Lagrange multipliers of this constrained optimization problem. Um, and it's almost always the case uh, that these two problems are equivalent. Um, and this is known as so-called strong duality. I say almost always, you can come up with pathological examples where this duality is, is, is not strong, it, it's weak. Um, but in practice, it, I mean, as a general rule of thumb, you can always get this strong duality to work if you're if you're not completely silly. Um, okay, and so what do you, so if you turn this handle, I won't uh, I won't go through the derivation, but you go through this strong duality, um, you go through this uh, duality theory, and you manage to get a, a a different optimization problem. So now a maximization problem instead of a minimization problem, which also tells you the 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 robust, one plus a robustness. And so it has this following form. So now the measurement appears in this thing I'm maximizing instead of in the constraint. Uh, and I have a couple of constraints below. Um, and similarly, because we'll need it in a second, so I'll just present it now, but the, if you do the same duality theory for the, for the weight, you get a problem which looks very, very similar. Um, 
except for now I have a minimization in the objective, uh, but then the constraints are the same. So again, these two problems are, are very closely related through this duality theory. Um, and it's very easy to show, um, I mean, asking us, knowing whether or not a problem actually satisfies this strong duality is, is pretty simple. And so you can just check very easily that both problems have it. So these are really equivalent formulations. So this is really an equality now, uh, which is nice. Um, and one thing you can notice is that the, the dual variable, so if, if I look at what am I optimizing over now, well, this is a set of positive operators and each of them sum to one, right? So in other words, I'm, the, the dual variables are exactly quantum states uh, in both problems. So in both problems, you optimize over a set of quantum states. And so if you've got well, a set of quantum a states... Well, of course, yes. <clears throat> so what are the probabilities that, uh, with which the box uh, produces states? In this formulation as far well, as so, so, okay so 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 far this the, the, this the duality is not about the game just yet uh, so far i've just got the i just use the duality and i noticed that the the duality gives me sets of quantum states and so now the only the final ingredient is to just to say well what are the probabilities from the box okay. and so let's take the stupidest guess which is let, let's assume that the, it's uniform Right, so let, let's take these states and let's just assume for the minute that I that the game is I, I send you one of these states uniformly at random because that, that's an instance of a game and it, it's the simplest game you could imagine. And right. always the number of outcomes, no? Because it looks like yes, O, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So O is a number of outcomes, yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it's a trivial guess, and, and this is really the simplest resource theory where this all works. Um, but yeah, this is this is the guess we made. Um, and so you you put this in and then you go you go through the handle and you I mean you use this formulation and then you see that you really win this game. Um, so then let me just go back to the previous slide. So then with this game defined through this dual variables, you really then just plug everything in and you get one plus r. So it really works. So that this is a, an optimal game uh, for this task uh, achieves the maximum and so then this gives you the equivalence. Um, so very, very nice and simple. <clears throat> so this was the first game. So this gave us, this is what Noah Linden and I found that this was a, showed that we kind of quantify, we introduced this quantifier with a robustness and it exactly quantifies how well you can do in any state discrimination game. In particular, it, it bounds all state discrimination games and it can be achieved with a, with one particular or say a, a class of, of games. This is, this can be achieved. So that, that was our main insight. So now with, with Andres, we then, we were, yeah, we introduced the weight and we were kind of aiming at the same thing. And so now uh, we realize that there's a second class of games which aren't as famous or aren't as well studied as discrimination games, but nevertheless provide the, the tool we need. And so now it's a, we call them exclusion games or, or they're, they're known in the literature as, as exclusion games. So it looks very similar. So you have the same box, which is outputting again, you know, quantum states labeled by a classical variable X. But now your goal, instead of guessing which state was sent, your goal is somehow to avoid it. It's like the X is something you, you don't want to get. It, it's the poison chalice. And so you should just guess anything G, which is not equal to X. So a much kind of simpler game, you, you know, X is over here, it's the marked element, and you just want to declare anything else and we'll be happy as long as you declare anything else. You know, so, so what's a silly example of, of this? You know, why might you care about this? Well, you know, if you have some cheesy action movie, you might imagine that there's some bomb which is going to explode if and only if the blue wire is cut by the by the hero. Uh, and if you cut any other wire, you're going to deactivate the bomb, right? So in some sense, in this this game, you know, you're going to, the, the day will be saved and the movie will have a happy ending if the person cuts the green wire or the red wire, but will be sad if they cut the blue wire. And so this might be a quantum version of, of that game. So that, that's a, a very silly example. Um, but more seriously, uh, this game has actually appeared in the context uh, in quantum information theory. And in particular, there's a famous theorem by Pusey, Barrett and Rudolph on this, uh, you know, on the, the meaning of the quantum state. And they actually, the way that they prove the main statement that the quantum state can't be interpreted statistically is by consider, considering an exclusion game. So they, they managed to perfectly win an exclusion game and they show that that has implication about the quantum state. So this isn't something we pulled out of thin air. Um, we were kind of aware of this game because of the PBR theorem and, and that inspired us to, to look uh, in this direction. <clears throat> okay, and so now we do exactly the same. So, you know, we're gonna, we have access only to a single measurement M 
And so we do the same thing. We, we try to play the game optimally. And so now the only question is, what, what, how are we going to quantify the game? And so instead of looking at the success probability, it turns out it's nicer now to look at the error probability. So what is the error that you accidentally declare g equals to x when you, when you shouldn't have? So we can look at what is the average probability with which you go wrong. Um, and again, it's very similar to before, but you would now have a minimization over all the simulable measurements uh, of this quantity. And so again, and okay, you want to then uh, compare to the classical, what would you do if you had no access to a measurement? So again, it's very similar. So you should just, if you can't measure, you should obviously just always guess the least likely state. Again, it's, it's this kind of, it's the min eigenvalue versus the max eigenvalue kind of shaking its head classically. So you always guess the least likely state. Um, and then what we do is we look at this ratio again. So we, again, we kind of benchmark how well we do with the measurement. How, how many errors do we make when we have access to a measurement relative to how many errors do we make when we don't have access to a measurement and we then try to minimize this number, right? We want this error probability to go down. So we want to make this ratio as small as possible. That's our advantage. And hopefully not surprisingly at this stage of the talk, if you do this optimization, you get exactly one minus the weight. So this is the operational interpretation of this number. So when the weight is equal to one, then this, I manage to get this all the way down to zero. So I never make a mistake. And when the weight is not equal to one, uh, is not equal to one, then I will make some mistakes and I'm, I'm quantifying the, the error here. Right, so this is just, again, it's a restatement. It just, this is advantage in this exclusion games. Um, <clears throat> and the proof is, is, I mean, runs parallel. So the primal now gives you the, the easy bound, which in this case is a lower bound, shows you that you'll never do better than one minus the weight. And again, you from the dual STP, you have this ensemble of states and you, you just use that as your guess. And lo and behold, you achieve the minimum. So it, it's, it's a very simple, I mean, what, once we've done the first one, the second one fell out of the sky very easily, but it was, it, it required looking in the right place, which was the main, I mean, was the key insight of, of Andres was to look at exclusion games. <clears throat> okay, and so now we can just quickly go back to our examples just to see how this all works together. So let's just, I mean, let's write, let's, combine all of the rank one measurements together. So when, you know, when O is equal to D, then this is the projective ideal measurement. And otherwise it's um, just a, a rank one measurement. So what we see before where we saw that one plus the robustness was equal to D, and we saw that one minus the weight was equal to zero. So this is just what we saw in the previous slide. And so now if you remember what was our, so in this case, then what is the optimal, what is the game we should play if, what is the optimal discrimination game we should play if we're given this measurement? Well, it, I mean, you kind of see how trivial it is. You, you give me the, the set of states, these orthogonal, uh, well, the, the set of states which are not necessarily orthogonal, but I give you these pure states which are defining the measurement and I give you them uniformly at random. And if you do this, then, I mean, you do the calculations, again, they're very simple, and you find out that your winning probability this, this guess success probability is, is D over O. So, you know, if O is equal to D, you win all of the time. And when there are more states than the dimension, then, you know, you don't win all the time, but you do pretty well. Whereas classically, you would just guess in one over O of the time. And so of course, then the ratio is equal to D, which is what we were expecting. So we get this D times advantage by, by playing this game. So it, it just falls out nicely. <clears throat> and now for the exclusion game, what how does it work well you can do um you can actually now send very mixed states so you don't need so in, in the discrimination game you need to send these pure states what's nice is that for the discrimination for the exclusion game you can actually send very mixed states you can send rank d minus one states uniformly at random and again because of the fact that this has you know th this is in, in all of the hilbert space except for one bit of the hilbert space right it's kind of it's expanded over everything but one dimension and so this measurement allows you to figure out which is the dimension it's not along, and then you you never guess the, the wrong direction. So it's it all kind of fits in very trivially. So you never make a mistake when you uh, have access to the measurement. You would make a mistake if you didn't have access, if you didn't have any possibility of making a measurement, and so therefore the, the ratio is zero, which is what it should be. Um, so this is the case for rank one. So we kind of see that it's possible to win them both perfectly. And now let's think about then the rank. Can I have a question? Of so th this example is for rank one, uh, like general measurements, not only projective. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Any number of outcomes O. 
larger than or equal to D. And so now, yeah, let's look at this other extreme. So this is the more interesting case because we, we saw that here, the, the two results that the, the robustness was very low, whereas the weight was still maximal. And so, yeah, one plus R, if you just plug it in, is, is, is tending towards, uh, it's just a little bit larger than one, whereas one minus the weight is still equal to zero. And so now the discrimination game, the optimal one, if you solve the STP, is again now to send these very uh, high rank states, to send these rank D minus one states. And of course, they're very hard to discriminate from each other. Um, and so what you can see is that even if you have the ability to perform this measurement, well, you do a little bit better, but you only do, I mean, you, you don't get much of an advantage from this measurement in, in discriminating states. So this is kind of, they're naturally why the robustness is, is close to one, because there's no game with where you can discriminate well using this measurement. So they look very bad from the from this kind of discrimination type uh, task, or I like to think about this now as kind of discrimination type information. Um, <clears throat> whereas if we come and think about the, um, exclusion type of task or this exclusion information well again now you can actually send me these rank one states so it's really like everything is flipped so i send you a rank one state which is you know supported in the null space of the of the measurement each one and then now again because because you're not in this direction you you can rule it out perfectly so again you never make a mistake so i mean for me the message here is that there's we should really consider these two tasks as telling us that, that we should think about kind of different types of information games. Um, obviously exclusion is just a much easier task to win, but quantum still uh, provides you with this kind of perfect advantage uh, with noisy measurements. And so this is why these measurements should be thought of as being very powerful, because I now have a task where I, where I basically do much, much better using this measurement than I could do classically. So this is the, the meaning of it being maximally uh, resourceful. Um, Okay, and so let me just check. Also, I've overrun a bit, sorry. So th this last bit is quite technical, so I won't say too much. Um, so just wanted to say that, we, that when you think about the games, you get a, um, these error probabilities. If you, check all, if you check over all games, either for the guessing probability or for the error probability, and you find that your one measurement never does better than the other measurement, actually it turns out this is sufficient to know that there is a simulation so this is a, a kind of a, a relatively I, I mean i find this kind of curious it really captures the notion of simulability the, these these games because you can simulate if and only if you never do better uh yes exactly uh, in in either class of game All right so that, that's a bit technical let's just leave it there and so just in the final two minutes, then, you know, I focused exclusively here on, on this resource theory of measurement informativeness. And as I said, in this case, everything is really as simple as it can be. And that's one of the, one of the key kind of reasons why I like playing with it, because it's a very nice playground to try and, you know, gain some intuition. Um, but what do we see more generally? Well, what we found in, in general, I would say, is a, is a four-way correspondence, uh, of which I, I spent most of this talk telling you about uh, uh, two of them. So I've I, so with the robustness, for example, I showed you this link between the robustness and discrimination games. And in the last 30 seconds, I, I flashed up something which I call the complete set of monotones, which shows that there's also this, that once you've got the games, you kind of come down and you think about all of the games and it turns out this is necessary and sufficient conditions for, um, the, for the allowed transformation. So this gave us these three aspects. And one bit I'm not gonna tell you anything about at all, but just to say that there's a kind of a fourth corner which is a kind of getting very much into information theory. And one can think about a, a channel capacity associated to these measurements, and in particular, a single shot uh, channel capacity, so a single use of a channel. And it turns out that we get a, an exact correspondence here too. So th this is a kind of a four-way correspondence which exists for the, for the robustness. And then what was nice is that for the weight, kind of we just extended everything and we got uh, all four corners of this, of this um, of this correspondence we found all of them again so we found we had a weight then we found exclusion games they also formed a complete set of monotones and you can also do this single shot information theory um so this is this is kind of a, a very high level summary of what we found and so now you can say well how general are these these results and so some of these links we're seeing indications that they're very general so for example this link between robustness and discrimination games well, now we know this holds in a whole slew of resource theory. So if you look at the resource theory of entanglement, or if you look at a resource theory where you look at, say, coherence in a quantum state, uh, 
EPR steering, something I've been working at a lot. It also holds, if you, you can also define a resource theory of teleportation and it holds um, like variants of non-locality scenarios, uh, which we call Buscemi, it holds. If you look at um, measurement incompatibility, so now not a single measurement, but sets of measurements, it also seems to hold. So just to say that this link here seems to be very strong. So this is kind of reassuring because we, we I mean, it's nice to see that this is not just special, this is, this is somehow a deep connection between discrimination and, and robustness. Um, <clears throat> and although, I mean, it's a bit more novel, but lots of these cases, I mean, I have, we haven't checked all of them in, in detail, but it, we haven't yet found a counterexample where it doesn't hold here. So the, this upper link between weight and exclusion also seems to go through. So that, that's very uh, positive. And then the other links, it is getting a bit more complicated. So we have kind of indications that these complete sets of monotones do seem to hold. So that that also, I mean, again, we don't have a full theory here, but we're working on, on this, just trying to make sure that we understand that this, this kind of, this side of the square is also there. Um, the one which is causing us the most difficulty at the minute is this single shot channel capacities. So the bit I didn't have time to talk about is also the part which we don't know how general it is yet. Um, and in particular, that there seems to be some, some issues here when we when we think about the resources being regarding states. Um, so th this is kind of our big open, this is one of our big open directions at the minute is, is can we generalize this in some meaningful way so that, it, that we have this kind of single shot information theory. And I, I think this will be challenging, but I, I'm, I mean, I, I think it will be worthwhile doing. And so then just finally, you know, we've got these two, two faces of this cube. And what we're also particularly interested in is, is there some way of transitioning between these two faces? Um, and with my student, Andres, he had a, a very nice insight. Um, and he thinks that, well, all the indications are, and we'll be putting an, a paper on the archive soon about this, is that the, we, we think if we introduce something called horse betting with side information, so it's, it's a task which hasn't received that much interest, this does seem to discriminate. I mean, this seems to extrapolate between kind of discrimination games or can be viewed as a special instance of this and exclusion games can be viewed as a special instance of this. And it seems that we can transition all the way between the two. And so we're quite excited because we think this kind of gives a, a much more general uh, connection here in, in this cube. So this is our, our kind of, this is where we're going uh, as, as we speak. So just trying to, to get this to work and, and to understand how general all of these results are. Okay, and so let me just then conclude very quickly. So hopefully I uh, convince you that taking this resource theory approach to this old question of measurement informativeness was useful because it inspired us to look at geometric quantifiers and which have then kind of relatively clean operational significances um, and gave us things like necessary and sufficient conditions for, for measurement simulation, which is, I mean, measurement simulation is, is of interest in its own right. Um, and then I just very briefly at the end just sketch this four-way correspondence, uh, which we're, I mean, we're quite excited about here in Bristol because we think it really is, I mean, hinting at some kind of deep underlying structure here. So this is all relatively new and we, we haven't yet, we're definitely not at the bottom of this rabbit hole, but we, we, we're kind of, we think it's worth going further here. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, our future work is on bridging these results with, with horse betting and with risk. And, and with that, I say thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Paul, for this interesting talk. So, has anyone a uh, question? That, uh... Maybe I can have a question. Okay. Uh, so, I'm working on ultra cold atoms and I'm collaborating with experimentalists. And then I'm thinking how much what you are showing uh, can be useful there. So, I have two, two questions. One is that uh, I was thinking about the definition of robustness. And uh, in this definition, there is this noise that you can add some noisy operator and then you are asking how much noise you can add mm -hmm. to have be still some well, informative. But the typical situation in experiment is that, for instance, they are measuring uh, the imbalance, the number of qubits up minus the number of qubits, qubits down. They have some result but they are not sure about the result in the sense that the, the resolution is not so good and they cannot distinguish if there was the imbalance equal to one or two or three. So they mm -hmm. have the result one in the machine, but uh, in fact, they, are, they, they know that there was some noise in the machine. And then uh, I was thinking if your definition of robustness covered this case or, or not. 
so it, I mean, there is a sense in the, the sense in which the the final thing that they they have with with the um, with this noise and this lack of resolution, if you treat that as the POVM element, then you you could apply the definitions we gave and you could somehow quantify the whether or not that you know how 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 much that decreased the the informativeness of the measurement. I would say so. I think on the one hand, you could say yes. But I, I think you point also to something which is more which which is an interesting question, which is, could one think about more physical models of noise, uh, which aren't of these geometrical types? So th this I'm also very interested in, like kind of physical noise and understanding, in a in a more direct way, kind of like really degrading a measurement and then quantifying the 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 degradation that way. So I I would say that I'm not yet at the I, I would like to go further in this direction. Mm -hmm. um, which then might make it more relevant to you experimentally. Yes, we usually have some specific types of noises like this, uh, resolution detection or or uh, some quantum or some magnetic field uh, doing some jitter on lasers. And, okay. And then there are the questions: what to measure? What is the best uh, uh, the best operator to be measured? And then I have the related question because also we cannot measure. Um, if we have an ensemble of n qubits, we cannot address often a single qubit. Mm -hmm. what, what's usually measured in ultra cold atoms are some collective properties. Okay. We do some uh, operation like rotational qubit, but usually this is the same rotation of in each qubit independently, the same angles, and then you measure the imbalance. This is the typical situation. And then would be the question, uh, if I will add such constraint on types of measurements that I'm asking only about the, the, the collective measurements, how much from the theory can, um, can be then applied in, in such limited situation? So I, I think that, that, I mean, that, that, that's a really good question. So I, we can add constraints on top of the, I mean, these are kind of the base definitions, like the, the theorist definitions, if you like, and we could definitely add more structure on top of our problems to, to restrict to certain subsets and then make it more, to make it potentially more relevant to, to a given setup. So that, that's definitely possible. Uh, it's not something we've looked at, but it, it, it could be, yeah, that, that, that's an interesting thought. Um, okay. Okay, so any other I, question? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm just gonna say like what, what I think, I mean, in practice, what I believe would be most useful if, if you really wanted to say, use this formalism to say something about your measurements is that then you, like it would be useful to discuss and we could potentially say figure out if we could propose for you a simple experiment based upon say the discrimination game mm -hmm. so any discrimination game gives you a bound upon the robustness so then we could say propose just try to see given your capabilities to propose a kind of an experimental setup which you would then interpret as being a discrimination game and then from that experimental result, you would say, well, look, we've just experimentally verified that our, our, our measurement is this informative. Right. You know, that, that's one way we could envisage using these results to do something in the lab. Um, I, I think it's very often some sort of discrimination game. Like in the interferometry, there is some classical parameter like magnetic field or, or frequency, which is somehow encoded in the state. And the whole goal is to measure this, this mm -hmm. parameter. And of course, there's the question what to measure to, to have uh, some precise values. This is, well, people are using, usually quantify states using this Fisher mm -hmm. information. And then from this theory of Fisher information, we somehow extract what to be measured. Yeah. Maybe there are other ways, better ways. Can I ask the question? Of course. Uh, I have the following question. Would it be possible to use some very rudimentary quantum mechanical experiment like stern gerlach experiment and run step by step that experiment trying to map it on that beautiful presentation of formalities you have presented? That would help some people who are not so familiar with the quantum information theory to appreciate the beauty of what you have formulated? So, uh, I, I think you can, yes. So, so one thing that Nora and I... Have... That hasn't been done. I mean, after all, this is that's supposed to be a part of physics, at least. Mm -hmm. So, well, I mean, that would be uh, clarifying for more of the audience. 
Okay, I see. So, so yeah, apologies if I, if it was a bit too abstract today. I, I I could have maybe tried to ground it more in in physics. So I mean, what one thing that Noah and I have been looking at a, a particular measurement scenario is is with say lossy uh, photon detectors. So if you have an array of detectors and they are, you know, you have your so we know that it's very hard to detect photons in the lab. Uh, and so as far as I'm aware, uh, the, like a, 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 the, the, the easiest way to count photons in the lab is to have many beam splitters and then to have many detectors at the end such that you, you know, if you want to count four photons, you would try to get it so that you would get four clicks. And then you would, that would allow you to kind of have a, a relatively cheap way of say counting photons. Um, so you, we, we've been applying this theory there and we, we can say, this allows us to see what is the best architecture for for doing it. Should you do like a, a big tree of interferometers or should you do kind of a linear interferometer where at each stage you you come out? So th these kind of things we've been playing with, we haven't written it down in a paper yet, but these are the kind of, th these were the thoughts we had to try to connect to the to real world, if you like. So we were focusing mostly on photons at the moment, um, but we'd be very happy for, I mean, if other people have suggestions for what they would really like to understand, I'm very happy to to ground it, but I think this is the closest thing I have to your suggestion with the Stern Gerlach is is using a you know beam splitter arrays it is the one thing which is relatively simple and and might give some insight. Okay, any other question? So perhaps I would like to ask one question. So. Um, as you consider such uh, things like distillation of, I mean, entanglement theory, we have distillation of entanglement, so you could also define it here somehow, no? So that you have many copies of the same measurement, or have you thought of this? So, so obviously, with <laughs> I mean, with, with measurements, that you, you, it's kind of very natural that you can use it more than once, right? As in, like, entanglement, exactly. we kind of naturally consume because you perform yes. a local measurement and you destroy the entanglement. With measurements, you can, in principle, use it more than once. Uh, Noah and I, are, we're just finishing up something now where we, we look at this measurement simulation, assuming that you can, say, perform the measurement n times inside the box. Um, mm -hmm. And then it gets more, and then it gets quite interesting. So this is a bit like a distillation in some sense, because you, it is kind of, so we, we, we know, we think we know a little bit about the rates of, of in, I mean, like how many uses of measurements do I need in order to simulate another measurement? So I think it is an interesting question, but it, it mm -hmm. seems that, I mean, as far as we could tell, very little has been done in this direction. And we have kind of first, the first results, which just show that you can do something kind of, which seems to us to be non-trivial and interesting, but we, th there's more to be done, I would say. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so maybe one more question. <clears throat> So did you consider scenarios in which you have like the, the system on which you uh, perform the measurement is uh, entangled, for instance, with another system and you have access to this other system and you can somehow play with it or you know, perform some measurement? Uh, so not, I mean, not directly. So that is, um, so in the steer, I mean, steering in some sense is the, the resource theory of steering, the results there that link the robustness of steering to uh, discrimination is in some sense a bit like this because you Alice does her local measurement exactly. and then you've also got Bob on the side and then you mm -hmm. allow Bob and Alice to do an LOC, a one-way LOCC measurement and then you find that the that the advantage you get in a in a discrimination game where Alice and Bob can have this one-way communication is exactly the robustness of steering so I guess it's as close as it is to your question but I I, again, I, I believe there could be more to say here. Like, I think your, I'm not sure your question is exactly about steering. So it could be that there are other well, quantifiers. Exactly, because you think you need uh, at least two measurements to, well, to observe steering, okay? Yeah. Now, okay. okay. With one measurement, like to... question. Yeah, it, I, I don't know. It, 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 it's an, I haven't, we didn't think about it, but yeah, it's a nice idea. Okay, thank you. Great. So let's thank Paul again for this talk. Very much. Uh, and if anyone has a question that would like to ask now, maybe Paul, do you have time or? Sure, yeah. Okay. So let me conclude this, this colloquium at the, at the moment. And uh, if someone else would like to ask question, he or she can ask it now. So I have some questions. <laughs> I have to leave, unfortunately. Okay. But thank you for the presentation. No, th thank you for the questions. These, these are good to think about. It's difficult to switch between theory and uh, experimental side, I think.
this was my problem. Yeah. Which can be very useful. Yeah, I mean, if you have any thoughts, let me know. I, I, just, uh, we're very happy to collaborate and we would love it if this is actually useful to, to mm -hmm. groups to say benchmark. I mean, if, if this could be a useful way of benchmarking in the real world, we'd be extremely happy. Um, yeah, I think this group from Basel, Philip Troitlein, they, they are doing things. Uh, okay. Could be maybe uh, related. Okay, I'll, I'll have a look. Thank you. Okay, bye.